Now in Second Samuel 21, Now there was a famine in the days of David for three years, year after year. And David inquired of Yahweh, and Yahweh answered, It is because of Saul and his blood, bloody house, because he killed the Gibeonites. So the king called the Gibeonites and spoke to them. Now the Gibeonites were not of the sons of Israel, but of the remnant of the Amorites. The sons of Israel had sworn protection to them, but Saul had sought to kill them in his zeal for the sons of Israel and Judah. So do you guys remember this? So this is in Joshua 9. Remember when uh, Israel was, they were, you know, fr from the salvation in Egypt, God saving them, and then in wilderness 40 years, and then they're heading towards the promised land, and they're destroying, I think, the Moabites, Amorites. And so, remember even uh, Rahab, the prostitute, she hears about Yahweh, and she gets converted, uh, the whole um, Jericho, all that. And so, once Jericho gets destroyed, uh, even supernaturally, God just miraculously, with the wall falling down and everything, the Gibeonites, they were nearby, but with all that's happening, they know they're, they're, they're going to be destroyed soon. And so they, uh, I'll just read it. They worked craftily and went and pretended to be ambassadors. And they took old sacks on their donkeys and old wineskins torn and mended, old and patched sandals on their feet, old garment on themselves, and then moldy bread. And then they went to Joshua to the camp of at Gilgal and said, uh, we have come from a far country, now therefore make a covenant with us. So they're deceiving. Uh, this this is a few months ago, I think, I think, I hope you remember, but they're deceiving them. And in this situation, Joshua and the Israelites, they didn't inquire God. It's kind of ironic because like David here uh, in Second Samuel, he's inquiring God, but like they didn't inquire God and they just made a covenant. But, um, and they swore that, yeah, um, we swear by God, we're not going to kill you guys, destroy you guys. But after a few days, they find out, oh, they're actually from just nearby and they deceived us. But I pointed out how even though it was deception, uh, they, they swore what they swore based on that deception. And so that was a promise from like a hun hundreds of years ago, I think around 300 years ago. Joshua's time versus David's time. So that swearing took place like about 300 years ago, maybe 400 years, but yeah, three, 400 years. But uh, here we see in second Samuel, Saul in his zeal, he ended up killing many of the Gibeonites when Saul was alive, when he was king. And so God had brought famine in the land of Israel for three years, year after year. And remember, uh, famine was a really, really big deal. You can't go long without food. I mean, obviously, but like, what I mean is, you can't go long without getting good harvest, because uh, it's not like you have refrigerators. You can't think of our context where you have plenty of food. So this is really serious. I mean, even one year, it's, it's, not, it's not good. It's bad. But year after year, for three years, there's famine, um, probably like no rain issue, very little rain or no rain. And so David knows, okay, there's something wrong. And so he inquires of God and God says it's because of this issue, what Saul did. Now, when that is brought up, I think some people with their mindset, they might think, well, that's like, that's so unfair. I mean, Saul did it. It's his fault and he's dead. But why are we suffering? And so I know we need to take this very carefully. Well, what's important is this is the same Israel. So you can't take it. You can't take this in a wrong way. You know, you can't take this like, oh, well, um, my ancestor's ancestor back then, they committed whatever sin. And so we're suffering the consequence. You can't take that that way. Because when it comes to this issue here, this is the land of Israel. This is the country of Israel where Saul, who was king, did such a thing. And so God is bringing uh, judgment for not keeping the word because they clearly swore by God, by Yahweh, that they will protect them. They will not kill them. But Saul, he ended up killing them. So 
one of the main things that we see is just the whole thing of keeping the word. I know this came up a few times, but you see it again here. They're suffering the consequence for not keeping the word. And especially when you even swore by God. So then verse 3, uh, basically, you know, David said to the Gibeonites, What shall I do for you? And with what shall I make atonement that you may bless the inheritance of Yahweh, basically Israel? And the Gibeonites said to him, We will have no silver or gold from Saul or from his house, nor shall you kill any man in Israel for us. So David said, Whatever you say, I will do for you. And they said, uh, As for the men who consumed us and plotted against us, that we should be destroyed from remaining in any of the territories of Israel. Let seven men of his descendants be delivered to us, and we will hang them before Yahweh in Gibeah of Saul, whom Yahweh chose. So there is the thing of this being uh, from Saul, this sin having been committed by Saul. And so it's going to be his descendants, seven of his men, and we're going to hang them before your God. Maybe even our, our God. I don't know if they got totally converted to Yahweh, but and then it's gonna have. We're gonna do it in Gibeah of Saul, like his town. And uh, yeah, King David he gives them over. So, but verse seven, but the king spared Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan. Of course, we remember uh, Mephibosheth who was lame in his feet. He spared him, the son of Saul, because of Yahweh's oath that was between them, between David and Jonathan, the son of Saul. Remember David and Jonathan's uh, like brotherhood, they uh, made a covenant with each other. So <clears throat> for the sake of Jonathan, uh, Mephibosheth is spared, even though Mephibosheth is like the main person because he was directly from Saul, uh, directly from, you know, Jonathan, Saul's like first son, I think. But he's spared. But other seven sons of Saul, they're given over. Verse nine, he delivered them into the hand of hands of the Gibeonites, and they hanged them on the hill before Yahweh. So they fell, all seven together, and were put to death in the days of harvest, in the first days, in the beginning of the barley harvest. So this barley harvest, this is the first harvest that starts going on, like sp springtime-ish. So it's around April. Uh, this is soon after Passover, uh, the Feast of First Fruits. So around like April-ish, they ended up hanging them, and then now uh, Rizpah, the daughter of Aya, um, took sackcloth and spread it for herself on the rock from the beginning of harvest until the late rains poured on them from heaven. So uh, beginning of harvest, again, April-ish, it rains. This is like uh, October or so. This is like six months-ish. So it seems like that's what it's saying, that for six months, she tried to, you know, protect these bodies. Because when, you, when the bodies are hanged, you know, within like 24 hours, 48 hours, Within two, three days, the body starts, you know, rotting. You know, that starts happening. And usually when there are dead bodies, scavengers, uh, animals, birds, obviously they come. But uh, this daughter, um, her her sons and or cousins, relatives, seven of them got killed, paying for his their ancestor's sin. And... Um, I don't know if they had any part to do with it, but uh, they're hanged. And so this concubine of Saul, you do whatever to like protect the bodies. And she did that for, it seems like many months. And then um, David ends up, you know, he hears about it and he ends up like bearing all their bones and including Saul and Jonathan's bones. He, he gathers it and then buries it all together. So like verse 13 so David, he brought up the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan, his son, from there. And they gathered the bones of those who had been hanged. They buried the bones of Saul and Jonathan, his son, in the country of uh, Benjamin and Zelah, in the tomb of Kish, his father. So Saul's father was Kish, and uh, they have the bones all buried in that same area. So they performed all that the king commanded. And after that, God heeded the prayer for the land. So it's clearly implied God um, now gave rain again. We just see this thing of keeping the word and also God making sure that the word is kept. And God is a God of justice. Saul clearly did wrong, even though he probably would have known about um, the Gibeonites that were living among the Israelites. That even though they're a different um, group of people, they would have looked different from the Israelites. 
uh, he probably was aware of, of the oath, but he ends up just slaughtering them, a lot of them. And so this has to take place. And only after this, uh, God gave rain again. He heeded the prayer for the land. And uh, we just see some like war, verse 15, uh, when the Philistines were at war again with Israel, David and his servants with him went down and fought against the Philistines and David grew faint. Then Ishbi Benob, who was one of the sons of the giant weight of whose bronze spear was 300 shekels, who was bearing a new sword, thought he could kill David. But Abishai, the son of Zeruah, came to his aid and struck the Philistine and killed him. Then the men of David swore to him, saying, You shall go out no more with us to battle, lest you quench the lamp of Israel. So I think this is a clear indication just showing how David's going, go, growing older, okay? See, according to God's sovereign design, he had it be where, um, with the fall, you reach the prime of your life, okay? When you're in your late teens or early 20s. So from basically all throughout your 20s, that's kind of like the prime of your life. In the sense of physically I'm talking about and intellectually where, uh, I mean, when you look at, you know, the, the sports side, when you look at where people are at, usually starting from like late teens all the way to, you know, 30s. But I mean, already by 30s, things are kind of going down. Your hormone and everything, your, your physical strength, all kinds of things. And uh, just the reality is you can't avoid going downhill. And so... People that were so up there at one time uh, in all kinds of sports or like so smart and all that, uh, it doesn't last forever. You know, people that were once amazing sports stars that were applauded and, uh, you know, I mean, you can name gazillions, right? How's Michael Jordan doing these days? Well, he's probably not as good at, as, at basketball these days. You can name, you know, name after name after name. And some of us know this from experience that uh, physically, intellectually, um, you will go downhill. And you see that thing with David here. It, it tells us that, like verse 15, that he, he grew faint. He, he got tired. Like he's, he, he's weak now. He used to be a man of war where he's out in the battlefield and all that. But uh, they're telling him, look, don't go out to battle anymore. Because, you, you, you know, it's kind of like, a few chapters ago where they, they were saying, look, you not going out to the battlefield, that's helping us. So basically it's showing us that this mighty David who got anointed with age, he's more and more going downhill. And that's just reality. And so some of us here, uh, you, you might be at the prime of your life. Uh, don't waste it. Uh, use it for God. Hopefully uh, you're devoted to the Lord. I thank God in his providence, I got converted in my late teens. And uh, most of my hours were spent in just living in the Bible. Uh, just, I mean, day after day where I was just absorbing God's word like I probably can't now. I mean, I would read and read and read and just meditate and study and study. I can do it all day. And even nighttime, I can just absorb his word. These days, not so much. So, um, yeah, that time will come for all people. Uh, and we see that going on with David. And there's like a record of like some people, like verse 20, where people of six fingers and six toes. I think I, I may have brought this up before, but even today, uh, you can do a little search about some people who have six fingers and six toes. Even if today we don't, there's no one with six, six fingers. There's no, nothing different about this truth right here that the Bible records. There are lots of things in the Bible that you can't find suppo supposed evidence of today. It doesn't matter. It doesn't change the truth. It's true. It doesn't, regardless of whether you find quote unquote evidence or not. But there are some things where you can even find things like this right here. There are some people that have six fingers today. And um, it's just a extra backup that we don't even need. And then chapter 22 here. So Psalm 18 is going to come up. Chapter 22. Uh, then David spoke to Yahweh the words of this song on the day when Yahweh had delivered him from the hand of all his enemies. 
and from the hand of Saul. And he said, Yahweh is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, the God of my strength, in whom I take refuge. Look, I I want you to just, as you hear this, please think about this. Can you relate to it? Now, the original context is David, but just can you relate to it? And just let it just kind of just hear these words and just think about what's going on. So the God of my strength in whom I take refuge, I take refuge in him. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold and my refuge, my savior. You save me from violence. I called upon Yahweh who is worthy to be praised and I was saved from my enemies. When the waves of death surrounded me, the floods of ungodliness made me afraid. The sorrows of Sheol surrounded me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called upon Yahweh and cried out to my God. And he heard my voice from his temple. And my cry entered his ears. Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of heaven quaked and were shaken. Because he was angry, smoke went up from his nostrils and devoured devouring fire from his mouth. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down with darkness under his feet. He rode upon a cherub and flew, and he was seen upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness canopies around him, dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. From the brightness before him, coals of fire were kindled. Yahweh thundered from heaven, and the Most High uttered his voice. He sent out arrows and scattered them, lightning bolts, and he vanquished them. Then the channels of the sea were seen. The foundations of the world were uncovered. At the rebuke of Yahweh, at the blast of the breath of his nostrils, he sent from above, he took me. He drew me out of many waters. He delivered me from my strong enemy, from those who hated me, for they were too strong for me. They confronted me in the day of my calamity, but Yahweh was my support. He also brought me out into a broad place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. Yeah, I, I told you guys before about just the original context, but how everything somehow points to Christ. So I hope you keep that in mind uh, as you hear this. Yahweh rewarded me according to my righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands, he has recompensed me. For I have kept the ways of Yahweh and have not departed from my God. And all his judgments were before me. And as for statutes, I will, I did not depart from them. I was also blameless before him, and I kept myself from my iniquity. Therefore, Yahweh has recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to my cleanness in his eyes. So I remember uh, hearing uh, a Q&A session with one pastor. Somebody asked the pastor, okay, this psalm right here, where it says this, verse 21 to 25, How are you supposed to understand this? David is writing this clearly. How can he write this? It doesn't make any sense. That Yahweh rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands, he has recompensed me. For I have kept the ways of Yahweh, I have not wickedly departed from my God. For all his judgments were before me, and as for his statutes, I did not depart from them. I was also blameless before him, and I kept myself from my iniquity. Therefore, Yahweh has recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to my cleanness in his eyes. What? See, you can't not have a problem with this when you read this. It seems to not make sense. I mean, right away, it's like, uh, he, you know, murdered and he raped and what? Are you serious? See, guys, this is what's incredible. This is all based on the gospel. This is all based on Christ. As Jesus said, that all the law and the prophets and the Psalms point to me, Luke 24. 
and also Matthew 5, uh, like 17, 18, 19-ish. All the Bible points to me, Jesus said, including this right here, that uh, this is totally based on Christ, his atonement, his paying for our sins. This is all about Jesus. He is the only one who had clean hands and a pure heart, who always perfectly kept the ways of Yahweh. He never departed from his statutes. He was sinless. And so because of him, based on him, this can be true. As if I'm being rewarded according to my righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands, God has recompensed me. He has paid me back according to my righteousness. As if I truly kept the ways of Yahweh. I never departed from my God. His judgments, his, his law was always before me. All the statutes, I never departed from them. I was blameless before him. I kept myself from sin. How can this be? Because of Christ. So one day when we stand before God, it's going to be as though this is me. Jesus' righteousness, his sinlessness, I get to be clothed with. I get to wear. This is clearly all throughout the Bible, even from Genesis. When God killed the first animal after our first parents sinned, God clothed them with the skin of the animal. Whether animal or animals, we don't know. Whether it was one animal representing Christ, the one being, or whether it's two animals, one animal for each person, we don't know, but it's Christ. Um, just like the animal was killed, and with, his, uh, with that skin, they got to be covered. Jesus is killed for us because of us. And just like how the animal left that skin to cover them, Jesus' righteousness we get to be clothed by. We get to wear that pure righteousness. His white, clean, perfect righteousness. So one day when we stand before God, we are wearing the righteousness of Christ. And so when God judges us, there's no sin because Christ paid for it on the cross and we're wearing his perfect righteousness. So this psalm is ours based on Christ. See, scripture is amazing. This is about 1000 BC, David writing this and is prophetically pointing to Christ. So verse 25, therefore Yahweh has recompensed me according to my righteousness. As if it's my own righteousness, yes. See, 2 Corinthians 5.21 But God made him, Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf. So that in him, it's only in him, we get to be the righteousness of God. In Christ, we get to be God's righteousness. Which is just amazing. So... Yeah, uh, the psalm, it's kind of long, but just it's praising God, thanking God for his deliverance. But in the midst of that, just like David writes, according to my righteousness, because of my righteousness, God delivered me because he delighted in me because I was sinless. I was blameless before him. See, I, I even heard that pastor struggling, like trying to explain it, but there's, he, he was kind of struggling and because it seems to make no sense. How can David write this? He's prophetically writing the truth of the gospel out. How it ends up applying to David and all of God's people, whether Old Covenant or New Covenant. So yeah, uh, verse 50. Well, let's, let's go to 47. Yahweh lives. Blessed be my rock. Let God be exalted. The rock of my salvation. It is God who avenges me and subdues the peoples under me. He delivers me from my enemies. You also lift me up above those who rise against me. You have delivered me from the violent man. Therefore, I will give thanks to you, O Yahweh, among the Gentiles, and sing praises to your name. He is the tower of salvation to his king, hallelujah, and shows mercy. I don't know if this is mercy or hesed, 
You guys have a translation there? Yeah, this is Hesed. He shows Hesed, his loyal, loyal love, his steadfast love, faithful love to his anointed, to David and his descendants forevermore. So even the rest, all this is just all pointing to Christ. It's based on Christ. And um, uh, we can briefly go to the John 16. So in John 16, just a few verses. 16.1 These things I have spoken to you guys that you should not fall away. So Jesus is speaking these words to prevent them, to keep them from falling away. Verse 2 They will put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service. So I pointed this out before, but Muslims for hundreds and hundreds of years, for over a millennium, they've been proving this passage to be true. And also, there are others, like um, like Hindus, radical Hindus and such, that think that killing Christians is offering God service. And actually, uh, un unbelieving Jews during this time, they ended up fulfilling this too. Uh, as a matter of fact, remember, the unbelieving Jews themselves, like in, in Acts even, when Stephen is killed, the first martyr, uh, they think they're doing the right thing for God. Apostle Paul himself thought that he was doing service by getting Christians killed. But they're deceived when they're actually, in a way, like, quote-unquote, killing God because they're killing Christ. They're laying a hand on Christ himself. And these things they will do because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things I have told you that when their time comes, you may remember that I told you of them. And these things I did not tell you at the beginning because I was with you. So certain things, uh, God, or th certain things Jesus did not teach while he was with them, but the Holy Spirit will, will teach them. So, yeah. Uh, so, okay, real quick, this is like a good thing that came up. We see that in the psalm that we saw, David speaks about being delivered, being delivered. But here we see Christians getting killed even. So this is a really good issue. I know we may not be able to relate to it as much, but okay, how are we to take this? Is it that God delivers or does he let us get killed? Well, it's both. So you have to get your understanding from the rest of the New Testament. Just look at Apostle Paul's life. Many times he is persecuted. He's chased around and a couple times he even gets stoned. The, the capital punishment stoning, but he survives. And uh, David himself says, like in Second Timothy, that the Lord delivered him. So there's all this deliverance, even probably supernatural deliverance that he experienced. Like there's a time in Acts, I think it's Acts 9 even, soon after his conversion, where he uh, started preaching the gospel, and so the unbelieving Jews are planning to kill him. And so... He's in 922 Acts, but Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded, confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that Jesus is the Christ. Now, after many days were passed, the Jews plotted to kill him, but their plot became known to Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. But Saul's disciples took him by night and led him down through the wall in a large basket. <laughs> So there was a situation where Saul, Apostle Paul, he got in a big basket and he was led down like that. He, he got like delivered that way. And you see this kind of thing all over the Bible. You know, today, there are situations where our Christian brethren around the world, the Muslims and the, the government, they're coming after them. And uh, I hear about supernatural deliverances, okay? It's just goosebump giving where like, like, for example, the police slash the government hears that, yeah, those guys are Christians and they get the address and they break down into their house. And like many times, usually the Bibles are illegal to have. And they have a box of Bibles in the living room right in the middle. And if they find evidence of Bible, they can get them. And the Bible is right there like in the middle of the room or like living room or somewhere. 
And the police, like, I don't know, five, ten of them, they come into the house. They, like, you know, they just throw all the books down from the shelves and look for some Bible. They look under the bed. They look in the closet. They look, they search the whole house, but they can't find the Bible that's sitting right there, like in the middle of the, um, in the middle of the room. God supernaturally delivering them. I heard of these testimonies. I've heard of another story where they find a Bible and they open it, but they see blank pages. They don't see anything. They don't, they don't see what the Bible has. I've heard of these kinds of stories. But at the same time, we do have Christians that get martyred and it's up to God. Sometimes God does give the privilege of getting martyred for the Son of God, for Christ. And um, Apostle Paul himself, he wrote at the end of his life, when he was about to get killed, he knew he was going to get capital punishment and die soon. The last letter, 2 Timothy, that Paul wrote in 4.16, At my first defense, the capital, the, the trial, at my first defense, no one stood with me, but everyone forsook me. And these are fellow Christians that did not stand with, with Paul because of the fear. But Paul says, may it not be charged against them. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that the message might be preached fully through me and that all the Gentiles might hear. Also, I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion and the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. And we know Paul was talking about being delivered from every evil work and preserving me unto my martyrdom, getting to go into his presence. And that's what happened. So we have to get our understanding of deliverance from the whole of the Bible. Yeah. Quick summary is, today we saw uh, the famine three years in the land because Saul did what he did, not keeping the promise, not keeping the oath. So God brought that. And only after the execution, God heeded the prayers of the land. It's that clear with God. And then, uh, yeah, David um, celebrating deliverance in the psalm and the gospel right there and uh, about God's deliverance. So, Lord God, how you are the God of Israel, you are the God of David, you are the God of uh, Apostle Paul, you are the God of Israel, and you are the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. How the gospel is imprinted all over the place. And this whole theme of deliverance, Lord, how you are uh, the Savior, that deliverer, that's a huge thing. Huge uh, way that you function indeed. One of, the, one of the roles that you have taken, a huge one. Lord God, I pray for deliverance. For so many in all kinds of situations, Lord. Lord God, from uh, Eddie, that is, uh, that looks like he is dying, but Lord God, I know you can deliver. I pray for your supernatural working, for the bleeding to stop, that you would be merciful, Lord God. But almost more importantly, that the parents and everyone would come to know of you as the deliverer, as a savior, that nothing in this life is, it, it does not compare to eternity. Uh, spiritual reality so lord deliver i pray save i pray be merciful and uh all the brethren all around lord bring deliverance lord god answer their prayer and save and uh may we experience your salvation your deliverance your provision your working in our lives and be, be glorified through it i pray lord god uh, as that is your will bring deliverance i pray in jesus name amen